If you are anything like me, Baldur's Gate 3 has completely consumed your life. I originally had no intentions of playing as I really just don't like turn-based combat, but one day as I'm scrolling through TikTok, I noticed someone mentioned you could dual wield salamis. Now why would developers add the salami as the only food item in the entire game that you can wield as a weapon. It doesn't do anything special, in fact its damage is lower than almost any other one-handed weapon. But then it hit me like a panic attack on a warm summer morning. The developers were calling us out. They want someone to take this painfully underpowered weapon and use it to break the game. Well Larian, we heard you and we are up for the challenge. Now the rules are simple. You can still use spells to heal and buff ourselves or even to debuff the enemy, but if damage is to be done by any character in our party that we can control, Salami must be the catalyst. Now this run allowed both Paul and myself to form a deep and meaningful connection with the game. It's of course our game of the year, and maybe even my favorite game of all time, completely breaking the boundaries of what I thought was possible in an RPG. Now with all that said, let's see if Paul and I can beat Baldur's Gate 3 using only Salami. Our story begins with creating our characters. Paul went with a half-orc due to its ability to triple critical damage as opposed to doubling it. I chose a Dark Urge Githyanki as I found they have my favorite class bonuses, even if they're a little hard to look at. <laughs> they get Super Jump at level 3 and more importantly, Misty Step at level 5. Druids get a cantrip called Shalala which scales your main hand weapon with wisdom as long as it's a club. Considering how bad the salami damage is by default, this is almost required to do any semblance of real damage. Bam! And that's it for you! We both pick Druid for now, but we experiment with some additional builds later. We awaken on the Nautiloid with our brains full of parasites. Mondays, am I right? In most of my playthroughs, I would recommend stopping by to grab our cute little helper upstairs. However, he can't wield salami, so he remains firmly planted in his cartilage-filled cage, while we speak to Lazelle for the first and probably the last time. Since the ship holds no weapons worthy of our metal, we have to escape every combat encounter until we get to Faerun. Paul is unapologetically a Shadowheart simp, so we'd lead the imps to their doom before we force the pod to fart her out. A few dashes later, and we're finished with the prologue. A hand? Anyone? Watch this. This branch of flesh is begging to be pruned. That's, That's odd. fucking evil, bro. Yeah. Don't do it! it. Stop! Cease, you lose! CJ, stop! <laughs> Are you telling me those pencil arms did all that? <laughs> One of the first combat encounters occurs at the gate of the Druid's Grove. Since we can't participate until we've been properly armed, Paul grabs their attention and holds his turn while I sneak off and hunt down our Salami Salvation. There are only a few guaranteed spawns, and the most consistent and concentrated location for Salami Allocation I have found to be the storage room right before the Rogue Hideout. I think what it is, is the barrels have a specific thing like either produce or meat that that they can spawn if it's meat it has a chance to have salami in it if it's produce it's less likely so good here we go that's two more salami baby i check a few more spots before making my way back to paul i went ahead and leveled before initiating combat in order to capitalize on the increased damage of our salami, we immediately multiclass into fighter. Two weapon fighting is a great first perk since we'll be holding a weapon in each hand, and we don't want our offhand attacks to be a waste of a bonus action. Fighter will eventually grant access to additional attacks, but we'll get to that later. Okay, so if we look at our salami right now, it does one to four damage. Normally this would be based off of our strength since it's a club. However, Shalala, your staff or club becomes magical. It deals 4 to 11 bludgeoning damage and uses your spell casting ability for attack rolls. Our spell casting, of course, is wisdom, and our wisdom is our highest stat right now. So we're going to put Shalala on. This may actually kill them, if I'm being honest, since I have advantage. It may kill the first goblin. Bam! And that's it for you! These goblins have pretty low health, so we're able to dispatch them in just a few turns. Collecting our spoils, we go inside and let the intrusive thoughts take over. Bop! <laughs> our first trader is selling my favorite pair of gloves, Missile Snaring. 
and I wear them for almost the entire playthrough. Now, I had another idea for a salami-based melee build that involved a warlock and pact of the weapon. Since we've got a warlock princess right next to us, I invite Will to join our party. Provoke the blade! Warlock scale with charisma, so he'll make a great talking head as well. Now it's time for the reason I picked the Dark Urge in the first place. There's a bard named Alfira here in the Druid's Grove. If you inspire her during her songwriting, she'll come find you on your next long rest and ask to join your party. After going to bed, you wake up to realize the Dark Urge inside of you has helped Alfira join her old teacher in the afterlife. Doing another long rest will result in a crotch goblin appearing with a gift to celebrate your kill. We will be reintroducing necrophilia to your schedule in no time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's so not cool, dude. He gifts you the Deathstalker Mantle. This will allow me to turn invisible after a kill. It's damn near the best cloak in the game. You just have to live with the guilt of what you did to that poor girl. There's so much blood. Hungry for more XP, we sneak up on the goblins here at Blighted Village. Opening up with sneak attacks becomes our bread and butter throughout the rest of the playthrough. The ability to rob the enemy of an entire turn and gain advantage on our very first attack gives us the edge we need to make these combat encounters a somewhat fair fight. When the dust settles, we all reach level 3. Us druids get access to Action Surge, Shadowheart gets some cleric spells, and Will gets access to Pact of the Blade. As long as I can remember to cast it, he can now imbue his melee weapon with magic damage that will scale off his charisma much like Shalala. While we're over here, we make a deal with Lump and his goons. We'll need their help later on. A brilliant notion. While we're creeping around, we went ahead and grabbed the speedy Lightfoot boots for some extra lightning damage every time we use a dash. The gnome upstairs seemed in distress, so we help him escape his goblin torturers. That's so mean. No! <laughs> <laughs> At this point, we take some time to do some side quests before moving on to work on the main story. We wanted to out Kaga as a shadow druid and kill her for her amulet, the Broodmother's Revenge. We tried killing all these methods, but eventually gave up and used Will as bait. The confrontation back at the Druid's Grove gave us quite a bit of trouble, especially considering we're underleveled and half of the enemies can wild shape to gain a full health bar whenever they want. We gotta reload. I mean, that's the only thing we can do is reload at this point. Will's full dead and so is Shadowheart. They both full died. And that's she, okay, good. that's good. I'm glad she transformed. That's good. Oh, I don't yeah, mind I seeing what's going to happen. Yeah, you're dead. There you go. After a few tries, the Shadow Druids meet their end and were rewarded with another level. Yes! Let's go, <laughs> dude! That's a level up, too. Jesus Christ. We finally get our fighter subclass, which results in a huge increase in power. Battlemaster gives us access to a wide range of versatile and powerful weapon attacks. Paul and I both choose fainting, disarming, and riposte for our maneuvers. As for Will, he gets a new spell and his first feat which we immediately use on ability improvement to bring his charisma to 19. And lastly, Shadowheart unlocks level 2 spell slots. We are almost done with Act 1. All that's left is to take care of the goblin leaders and confront Auntie Ethel. We were met with a surprise when we got to the goblin camp. I thought about making... What the fuck? Why are we fighting? Oh. Dude, it is bugging bad. Like, the frames are so bad. Apparently, one of the absolutes we tried to kill earlier managed to escape and warn the goblins of our arrival. We would have preferred to save this for a later time, but there was no way we were killing all these goblins ourselves. Lump arrives and does his best, but doesn't stand a chance. Still heavily outnumbered, we manage to bottleneck everyone at the end of the bridge and take them out one by one. The game's performance issues started to show here with the sheer number of enemies we were facing, but later on we make some adjustments to our settings to compensate. Then reaching into his bag. Jesus. He's ice giving pick. you a lobotomy. What are you, the Kennedy's daughter? All three goblin leaders are actually quite easy if you knew how to deal with them. High Priestess Gut will give you an audience in her chamber if you speak with her. If you let her have her way, a certain devil sends you some help just in the nick of time. But your giblets will make for a tasty supper. Uh, that's gonna leave a mark. <laughs> Minthara is also quite easy. Simply pretend to go along with her plot until she orders her goblins to prepare for the raid on the Druid's Grove. Watch this. Control yourself. Once she goes to walk over this bridge, 
Use your salami to send her to the depths where she belongs. Now, no matter how you take care of Dror Ragslin, everyone in the compound will become hostile. So be sure to set your teammates up to take advantage of the upcoming fight. We don't normally subscribe to the cheese method of dealing with bosses, but in this case, we were actually using the salami to knock him off this ledge. So technically, it counts. Once the enemies are aggroed, maintain the high ground and work together to take them out one by one. Auntie Ethel's House of Horrors doesn't prove to be much of an issue either. We used our spare salami to easily circumvent the traps before we confront her at the end. Typically, this fight is actually pretty difficult, even more so because we don't have any ranged options to get rid of her clones. But when she attempts to deceive you by shapeshifting into Mayrina, you can use Examine to check the stats and see which one is real. Paul had the brilliant idea to use Hold Person, which normally wouldn't work considering her hag form is not humanoid. But she isn't in hag form. This is a great example of why I love this game so much. That kind of attention to detail really allows you to get creative and have some fun taking down these tougher enemies. For the first time in 30 years, Auntie Ethel is surrounded by more meat than she can handle. When she gets low on health, she'll try to make a deal for her life. If you can pass a persuasion check, she'll give you a piece of her scalp and leave Mayrina behind. The scalp can give you a permanent boost to one stat of your choice which we of course choose Wisdom since that scales our salami damage. And since Paul was the one who got us out of that sticky situation, I'd say he more than earned it. I want to eat some more of this if you're not careful. Oh, mmm, mmm, it's so good. Oh my God. <coughs> we say goodbye to the grove for now and head into the Underdark. Here we are, Underdark, baby girl. Now it's at this point where we make a pretty big blunder. We were in too much of a hurry to get to Act 2 and skipped almost all of the Underdark, missing out on a ton of experience points. We're already underleveled at this point. Most people are reporting that they're entering the Shadowlands around level 7 and 8, but we're only just now reaching level 5. Now that we're fighter level 4, we get our first feat, which of course goes straight into ability improvement to increase our wisdom. At 19 wisdom, our salami is doing roughly 5 to 12 damage. Not bad, but not necessarily good either. Will's fifth level is much more exciting as he gains access to deep impact giving him an extra attack, and he gets access to level 3 spells. I end up taking Counterspell, not really understanding at the time how broken the spell can be if used right. Lastly, Shadowheart levels up and uses her feet to grab a few more Cleric cantrips. After doing a long rest, we wake up and realize True Soul Nier is dead, and everyone has already left. So, we follow suit and move on to Act 2. After about a week with a sore throat, I've just gotten my voice back and can put off narration no longer. Much like these lands, I find my voice blighted with no option but to push forward. We meet with the terrified Harpers on our way to Last Light Inn. No, I think something's coming after us. Oh shit. This is actually scary. Yeah. Oh! Yep. Well, all you he did was did. bonk your head. Oh no, you're dead, yeah. Okay, sorry. They lose a few of their own to the monsters, but our team survives the ordeal. Meeting up in town, we head straight to Isabel to obtain our blessing and ease the burden of the shadow curse. The absolute rear their ugly heads, and we prepare to defend Isabel with our lives. Our recent patch was supposed to prevent her from dying before we even get a turn, but we got unlucky and were forced to load a previous save. Did seven damage. That's Dude, bad, huh? we They're may have to restart bird. this. She died! Thanks to Jahira and the disarm maneuver, we finish off the last of the demons. Now we can't get into Moonrise Towers until we've obtained a Moon Lantern, so we join the Harpers in an ambush. Deception. It is, guys, I swear. See, Except look. Bro, you can trap If it is a Majesty's will. You can't be serious. You know what's out there. If it is her Majesty's will, Jesus, then we fuck. shall walk. Okay. <laughs> she will protect us. The fight's over almost as quick as it started, and we head straight to Moonrise. For some reason, Paul and I decided to just attack the guards out front, not realizing they're three levels above us. They almost wipe out the entire team and prove to be more trouble than they're actually worth. We had never been to Moonrise on any of our other playthroughs, so we had no idea you could just waltz through the front door and everyone would think you're one of them. 
After sneaking around back, we managed to kill a group of Null Archers and their master. This would end up helping us out later on. Killing anyone else in the tower wasn't really an option considering how outnumbered we were, so we began to explore. After long, we ended up in the House of Healing, confronted by what can only be described as a living nightmare. The way Malice toys with his paralyzed victims sets our teeth on edge. We managed to get lucky and talk him into killing his nurses. This is some Silent Hill shit, dude. I'm sorry. Fighting him proved to be much easier once we got into a rhythm. He would raise a nurse and then turn around and kill one of us. Then we'd kill the nurse again, save our teammate, and get one salami slap in before repeating the cycle. It was arduous, but effective nonetheless. Can do hey, nice what critical. Health? What health? Come on, Will. Yes! <laughs> GG, Doc. That scene was crazy. I did not like that at all. Next, we were headed for the Gauntlet of Shar. The first few hurdles were nothing we couldn't handle, and managed to hit level 6 after going back to Act 1 and finishing off a few goblins. Paul and I finally get access to our extra attack, allowing us up to 4 salami swipes on our opening turn. Will gets another level 3 spell, and I grab Hypnotize, while Shadowheart grabs Mass Healing. We quickly get through the trials and arrive at the Night Song. Now, when I say we spent hours trying to fight Balthazar the old-fashioned way, I am not exaggerating. The number of enemies mixed with the mages constantly putting us to sleep resulted in our defeat again and again. We had to get creative and find an easier way to take him down. We realize that if you do a sneak attack, it gives us a prompt to counter his raise the dead spell, resulting in a 1v4. This was obviously much easier, but just to be safe, we casted silence to ensure his attack options were limited. Yes! Let's oh go! Oh my god. Oh. Finally. Oh, we did it! <laughs> Fuck me. With Balthazar dead, we free the Night Song and head to Moonrise Towers. When we arrive, we decide to take the alternative route and parkour to the roof. This would give us direct access to Kethric Thorm without having to take part in the fight downstairs. This does, however, result in Jahira's death, so I don't recommend doing this if you want the Harpers to survive. Even after disarming Kethric and having the Night Song fight with us, we continued to struggle with this encounter. We did manage to beat it, but only just by the skin on our teeth. Here we go. Hold on. It was there for a second. There's a there's one frame. Oh my god. You... <laughs> I'm gonna kill you! And? Okay, she's dead. Uh... Goodbye. Jesus fucking Christ, dude. It finally dawns on us that we're under-leveled and we had rushed through the story way too fast. And before the final boss encounter, we decided to take some time to do literally everything left in Act 2 and even experiment with some other classes. We ultimately settled on a Paladin build for my character, while Paul stayed as a fighter druid. Paladins deal additional damage to the undead and can push some crazy damage numbers with Divine Smite. After beating the rest of Catherick's family and farming some of the Mind Flayer colony, we finally reach level 8. This gives us enough health and confidence to take on the final boss. The first phase goes very smooth. When our spell slots are full, we can manage a normal amount of damage, but when those run out, most fights turn into a slugfest. Going into phase two, we decided to try disarming attack. We honestly didn't think it would work, but sure enough, Paul uses his salami to smack the scythe from Merkel's hand. With Shadow Heart giving us a veil of silence, it's just a matter of time before we wipe him out and move on to act three. Finally, in Act 3, we're ready to finish our builds and finish this playthrough. At this point, Paul is impressed with the damage numbers we're pushing as a paladin and decides to switch to a paladin fighter. We still want the disarm maneuver, so he's sure to at least grab Battlemaster. The Githyanki monks quickly show us why they're the most broken class in the game, and at the end, I decide to take the advanced illithid powers. Me being the troglodyte that I am, I ate it instead of resonating with it not knowing this would prevent Paul from getting the powers himself. Sorry, buddy. Moving into Rivington, we immediately head to see Dribbles the Clown. He underestimates the power of the Divine Salami, and like all those before him, pays the ultimate price. It does, to me as well. I'm happy. <laughs> Dude, it's not opening. Do you see what he's doing? Uh -oh. <laughs> he's trying the lock. 
<laughs> I, don't, I hear it, but I don't see it. Yeah, he's trying. It just keeps getting denied. Now, there are two pieces of equipment on display in Raphael's house that we're in a hurry to obtain. Using invisibility, we sneak past the guards at the gate and grab the next waypoint. Now, the rest of the team can simply fast travel in. Walking into Worms Rock gives us the last bit of XP needed for level 9. We end up changing our builds again at level 10, so for now we're just going to gloss over 9. We're finally in the lower city, and I'm absolutely taken aback by the number of NPCs in this area. I know most people don't like Act 3 as much as the others, but unlike most games, this city actually feels packed and lived in. We're headed straight for the Devil's Fee, and we already know the ritual needed to enter the House of Hope. After descending straight into hell, Hope greets us at the front gate and later gives us a great cover story to deceive the Archivist. While Paul distracts everyone, I disarm the plate traps and grab both the Amulet of Greater Health and the Gauntlets of Hill Giant Strength. Now honestly, the fact that either of these exist is absolutely mind-blowing. The Gauntlets give you a minimum of 23 Strength and the amulet gives 23 constitution. Paul takes the gauntlets and I take the amulet. We're itching to hit level 10, so we head to the Elf Song Tavern to complete the Emperor's hideout mission. The Githyanki in this game are not messing around. Between their constant use of debuffs and devastating physical attacks, they give us a serious run for our money. However strong they may be, we have one thing they don't, cured meat. Nice. Fuck. That was tough. That was really hard. Oh, he's naked! Yeah. I took its tentacle in my yeah. hand. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Rip it off. Oh. oh. What? A history check to fuck it? Yeah, I passed it too. Which oh, is my God, dude. What the so fuck? <laughs> this is so bad. <laughs> You guys are it's monsters. So cool. Shadow Hearts going to be so mad. I don't give a fuck. She had her chance, bro. She's had over 10 hours. Oh, I think I'm making him come. We just need a bit more XP before leveling up again, so we head to the docks to take on a few Steel Watchers. Disarming these guys helps a bit, but they can still punch for a big chunk of damage. After dropping a duo, it's time to level up. Now, I thought by having extra attack on both Paladin and Fighter, it would stack, giving me three salami slaps per turn. Turns out, it doesn't. So after liberating the Gondians and learning we need to save their families, we head back to Withers to respec our characters for the last time. And we are familiar with the very overpowered Paladin Sorcerer build that gives you higher spell slots, allowing your Divine Smites to do some crazy damage. But we still want the Salami to play a role in combat instead of simply relying on Divine Smite. Since I don't need to focus on constitution at all, I can bring both strength and charisma as high as possible. We give our characters the minimal number of fighter levels to allow us both action surge and our subclass. Of course Battlemaster is the best option as it gives us the maneuvers we've been using the entire playthrough. Every level after that goes into Paladin, so we can get as many spell slots as that class allows us, and we use our feats to get our strength and charisma as high as we can. Will and Shadowheart are built a little bit different. I went ahead and took Will into 5 levels of Warlock, giving him a Pact of the Blade extra attack, and then five levels of Paladin. For one of his level two spell slots, we're sure to grab invisibility, but for some reason, these extra attacks do actually stack, so he's allowed three per turn, and his spell slots refresh on short rest. It actually turned out very viable, to be frank. Shadowheart remains a cleric paladin, taking as many spells as she can to keep our team from death's door. If we want the Steel Watchers gone before we fight Gortash, First, we need to rescue the Gondian's loved ones. We did our best to save all that we could before the timer ran out, but a few of these guys needed at least two turns before they can make it to the sub, and they ultimately got left behind. As long as this one survives, we can continue the mission. Finally, we head back to the Foundry, report our success to Tubin, watch all of the Gondians die in a valiant effort to liberate themselves from their oppressors, and move on to the Steel Watch Titan. Our original plan was to branch off and kill the left and right Steel Watchers as quickly as possible so we can all group up and focus the boss in the middle. Now remember that most of our salami power is spent after we use our higher tier spell slots, so by the time we get to the titan, we weren't able to do enough damage before it went into bulwark mode. After about 30 minutes of slapping the boss with sausage, we're finally able to get its health low enough to explode. On our way back to Worms Rock to fight Gortash, we managed to hit level 11. This allowed me to grab one last ability improvement, 
taking my charisma to 20 and my strength to 17. Since Paul's build is enjoying critical attacks, he takes Savage Attacker instead, and both Will and Shadowheart only obtain some extra spell slots. We had never fought Gortash in his living quarters before, so we truly had no idea what to expect. We managed to take out one of his guards, but on his first turn, he does a bunch of crazy, overwhelming shit that, to be honest, I didn't read any of this. I mean, all I know is we managed to use the Halt command and hold person to get him to chill out. By the time his little resistance bubble thing came off, we could start using our divine smites again, and it was game over. 22, he's dead, bro. Fuck him up. Finish him off. Let's go, dude. Killing Orin was next on our list. We tried really hard at first to find some clever way to cheese her off a ledge using salami, but ultimately we just ended up killing her the old fashioned way. We saw some really cool cutscenes though from the side of someone who refuses their ballist lineage. Honestly, we're blown away by how many extra cutscenes, interactions, and items you get while playing as the Dark Urge. And this ultimately caused me to start my own evil playthrough just to see how different the game is. We finally retrieved all the nether stones and before we confront the nether brain, we slay some of Cazador's minions for that last bit of XP. Level 12 is a bit humdrum as it only gives us access to tier 3 spell slots and not much else. If you want a more in-depth guide on the equipment and builds we went with for the final boss, just watch until the outro where I'll go over it in more detail. After 40 hours of grinding this playthrough with what is likely a very disgusting piece of salami gripped tightly in our hands, it's time to take on the nether brain. See, it's the saving throw of 99. Oh! oh it doesn't Why? Did that just fucking happen? Did you do it? We rolled a 20. Let's see what happens. We hey, just does this count as salami? That's so <laughs> anticlimactic, bro. If you roll if a nat 20, the, the game should be beaten. That's such bullshit. We found that by using invisibility, you can simply walk past every single enemy, starting from these first few you encounter here in the upper city, all the way until you reach the crown of Karsis. Once you've opened your portal, squeeze everyone in, except Shadowheart because somehow she got found out, drop a globe of invulnerability if you have it, and just go to town on that brain. Third. Can't even disarm it. I think we got it. I think we just beat the game. I don't have any more attacks, so it's on you. Get it. Oh no. Very cool. Finish him off. Come on. I don't have a potion of speed or anything, so I can't do any more. Come on. Finish That's him. it. Yes, that dude. Game? That's the end of Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yep, 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 yep. After just a few turns of salami salvation, the nether brain is begging for its life. Seizing this moment, we force the brain to rid us of our tadpoles and destroy itself, saving both Faerun and all of its denizens. You made it to the end of the video. Thank you so, so much for watching. And thank you to our channel members who are so incredibly kind and support the channel every single month. If you're interested in becoming a member, just check the description for more details. The remaining footage will cover our builds in a bit more detail, so stick around for that if you're interested. If not, we'll see you next time. Later. Okay, all right, so we're gonna quickly go over the equipment for the... This is essentially the build for dealing the most damage with the salami that you possibly can. It's just the Paladin Sorcerer. Uh, six levels of Paladin just to get, of course, Smite and the ability to use Smite. And a few of spell slots, but then level six Sorcerer so you can get up to level five spell slots as well. Uh, the level five Smite, of course, scales all the way up. I think it's one extra D8 for every single... Is that it? Yep, deals an additional one D8 of radiant damage per level. So... Um, for equipment, this is Paul's character. He's an orc, so when he lands a critical, he rolls three damage die instead of two. I went ahead and put the circlet of hunting for extra damage with Hunter's Mark. Uh, Hook of the Weave. You can go with any cloak. I don't know any cloaks that deal extra damage, so I don't think it's relevant. Armor of Agility. There may be an armor out there, like a chest piece, that deals a little bit extra damage, but nothing too relevant, in my opinion. Uh, Gauntlets of Hill Giant Strength. This takes his strength to 23. And it's what allows the salami to scale at its highest possible um, strength scaling, because technically it is a club, and therefore the damage goes off of strength, if I'm not mistaken. 
We are very new to the rules of D&D. You know, if we got things wrong in the video, I do sincerely apologize. Please feel free to correct us in the comments. Just be nice, of course. Um, then we have the speedy light feet. When the wearer dashes, they get three lightning charges, and then lightning charges can be used to deal 1d4 of electricity damage. So if we were to dash before we do our attack, we'd get some extra. And oftentimes we are dashing because we don't have any ranged options. That's one thing I didn't really cover in the video. Not having ranged options is incredibly debilitating for the entire playthrough because almost everything is across the battlefield. So after you kill one thing, you have to move across the battlefield. Sometimes you're using a whole turn just for that, whereas most characters would just throw a fireball or put up a wall of fire or something. So. Okay, and then for the amulet, paralyzing critical. This doesn't do anything for us right now per se, but it does, anytime Paul lands a critical with this character, it does allow him to stun them. And then this just gives him more criticals that after he kills something, normally on the first turn, he can move to something else and do another one again immediately. And of course you get a divine smite, an extra divine smite on your critical. Caustic band, this just does two uh, acid damage, just a ring we had that kicked up the damage a little bit. Um, this legendary bow gives celestial haste, so it lets him have more actions per turn. Any shield works as long as it's not. I think there's a shield that actually does damage. It's the legendary one. I wouldn't use that if you're going for salami only. But again, this isn't the absolute best build possible for one-shotting things. I mean, you could probably go for a better poison on your weapon. It's just I put on diluted oil of sharp, diluted oil of sharpness, and then I have my character over here who's concentrating on um, elemental weapon for him, while this character concentrates on, I believe, Hunter's Mark, if I'm not mistaken, the extra damage from that. So, and then all of that created the big damage number that you saw before. Let's see if we can replicate that real quick. Oh, I did actually just use the wrong Branding Smite level, but who cares? Look at that. It's, it's still a lot of damage, man. And then bam, 56 on the Divine Smite. So, and uh, so that that's how you would likely and again please feel free to optimize it however you want to but this is what a paladin sorcerer looks like now in theory you could just walk over here attack somebody else and then not only do you get another critical from killer sweetheart but you can just do all of that again just with the level four smite instead so uh paladins are great for damage and short bursts but after that as you saw in the video it uh tends to fall off pretty hard Okay, so let's go ahead and look at how the team was looking before we went and fought the Elder Brain, what our finer, final builds were not using the Paladin Sorcerer. All right, so here is our save file for right before we fought the Nether Brain. You can see I had taken the last version of the Illithid Tadpole that let me transform into a Mind Flayer. Um, we did Circlet of Hunting. That's the one you saw in Paul's character earlier. Again, it's just because I like to use... Um, I like to use Hunter's Mark for extra damage. The Deathstalker Mantle, poor Alfira gave her life for this. But I did reject all other opportunities for Dark Urge options throughout the game. I don't think that makes her feel any better, obviously, because she's dead. But uh, Reaper's Embrace, it's just good heavy armor. It's got really high armor class. You can go with pretty much anything you're, you're happy with here. But again, we like to use stealth checks uh, when we go invisible. So this isn't optimal for that specifically. But... Uh, okay, Legacy of the Masters. This is, these are good gauntlets. So gain a plus two bonus to attack and damage rolls with weapons. Not bad. Um, it just gives us some extra salami damage. Boots of Psionic Movement. Because I am a Gith Yankee, and there's a lot of things throughout this playthrough that being a Gith Yankee really helped out. Um, I'm allowed 1d4 of psychic damage after I use Fly. And these boats, not only do they give you Fly, but I also have Fly. Um, just because I took the advanced illithid powers. So, Amulet of Greater Health, we went over that already. I normally use the Caustic Band, Ring of Regeneration. I also have a bow that gives me haste, just like Paul did. And then I have a shield just for the extra armor class. So, nothing too crazy. Just using Hunter's Mark to smack for lots of damage. Again, we still... We only have level two and three spell slots. I think this one gives me an extra level one spell slot, so it lets our divine smites go just a little bit further, so not bad. Uh, nine paladin, three fighter, 13 strength, that's about as high as I could get it. That should be higher, I don't know why that's not higher, but, and then lots of charisma. Don't know why my wisdom is that high. Maybe it's because I turned into a mind flayer, I don't know, but 23 constitution, very, very cool stuff. Now, Will's build is actually very interesting 
in my opinion. This is a great helmet you can wear, plus two bonus to attack rolls, initiative rolls, blah blah blah, and uses detect thoughts. Not bad. It looks kind of stupid on some of your characters, but I kind of like the way Will's horns poke through there. Cape, whatever you want. This is more armor class. Uh, chest piece, whatever you want, more armor class. He was our lock picker. Lock, lock picker? The person who lock picks? I don't know. So he uh, he used the gloves of thievery throughout the entire playthrough. And then evasive shoes for extra armor class and acrobatics. Absolute talisman. This is all just throwaway stuff that we had already. Already. Now this did come in handy. Exhort the Risen you get from this uh, ring. This allows you to use command spells on the undead. That was actually really cool. That, that came in handy a few times. And then just once again a shield. Um, because most of us took uh, dueling as our fighting style with paladin. It allows us to just go ahead and put a, uh, a shield in our offhand. It's free, free armor class. Why not? Okay. And then, so 17 dex. I just put his high so he can always take a first turn. 15 constitution, because why not? And then 20 charisma for scaling. And that's pretty much it. I mean, he, again, he gets the three attacks in a row because of bind packed weapon. And because warlock deepened packed stacks with martial class extra attack for three Total attack, so it's pretty good. Again, that's that's three smites in one turn, and technically two of them can be level three smites immediately, and then third one could be a level two. So really, really not bad at all. Wills was a lot of fun to play. I'm actually quite proud of this build as well. Again, the equipment could be better, but uh, we do we do what we can. And then Paul's build was, is pretty normal, except it has the Night Walkers. The headpiece was cool. He used a different one than what you saw in the Sorcerer Paladin mixture. And of course, he's also, like myself, a paladin fighter. But Horns of the Berserker, uh, you get plus two to attack rolls when attacking creatures that have already taken damage. And then your melee attacks get two necrotic damage as long as uh, you don't have full health. So as long as Paul is not at full HP, he'll get a, a boost. Cloak of the Weave to get absorb elements, pretty good. Um, armor of Agility, just for lots of armor class. Gauntlet's of Hill Giant Strength. Mist Walkers, we've already gone over this. And lastly, Shadow Hearts. Shadow Hearts was probably the lowest investment we did. She really just caught all the extra stuff that we had, because up until this final fight, she wasn't a Warlock Paladin for the entire game. She was either a, what was it, a Druid Cleric, and then just a Paladin Cleric for a while. And then this for this last fight, we thought we would need her. We didn't. She died right before we got to the Netherbrain. And we still didn't even need her. That's how much damage our builds were doing. Without go, and I, I want to stress this: we decided not to just put everybody into a sorcerer, um, a sorcerer paladin, because we didn't want to just rely on divine smite. We wanted to get some extra attacks in with our main hands, and uh, really let the salami do the work rather than the smites doing all the heavy lifting with the level four and five spell slots. Anyways, uh, brood mother's revenge. Uh, the Whispering Promise, when you heal a creature, you gain one D4 to attack rolls. And then that, again, once it's just a throwaway. Shield, throwaway, uh, spring step boots, all this stuff, just throwaway. That, that's only for unarmed, so I don't even know why she's wearing it, because those don't technically even work with her. And then this is, if the wearer is infested by a Mind Flayer Tadpole, they get saving throw stuff. It's the Emperor's armor, but that's pretty much it.